Hello, I am your teacher, Mr. Pachiti, and this is my classroom here in Baltimore, Maryland. So put away your mobile phones, put away your crack den hotel rooms. It's time to concentrate. It's time to study. This is the go home episode of Smackdown Live, and this is Graded. <laughs> We kick things off with the Kevin Owens Show, hosted by Kevin Owens. His guests tonight are Randy Orton and AJ Styles. Orton says that last week he saved the WWE Universe from having to watch a broken down, washed up, former Olympian from having to wrestle a guy who still thinks that he's at the top of the game, but isn't. He saved them from having to watch that match. Boo! AJ replies saying that last week Randy Orton screwed the WWE Universe out of that classic match, and despite the fact that Randy Orton has wrestled countless legends, he's only ever learned one move. And although that move is a very deadly move, still one move. But that's not fair, AJ, because Randy Orton knows bloody loads of rest holds. Randy then talks about AJ Styles' indie credentials, saying that while he was wrestling in high school gyms for dozens of people, Randy Orton was wrestling for tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands at WrestleMania. AJ says, sure, you were wrestling for WWE getting suspended for failing drug tests oh this is this is heating up Randy says that the truth is AJ if you're as good as you think you are you would have been in the WWE a long long time ago and you have now assumed the role of corporate bitch and then Kevin Owens just stands up and gets the hell out of there the two then square off and start brawling and then AJ Styles goes for the phenomenal forearm but Randy Orton catches him hits him with you know what the RKO when you have a move that deadly all you need is one and then Randy Orton picks him up and, and locks in a headlock for for five minutes that's that's not true I made that up a terrific opening segment here, and one that gets an A. It achieved so much in less than 10 minutes. Those guys were in the ring for like six or seven minutes, and they've effectively built hype for the WrestleMania match, a match that I now really, really want to see. A month ago, if you'd asked me, did I want to see AJ Styles versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania? The answer would have been an absolute no, but they've done a great job of building this feud with limited time in the past few weeks, so fair play to them for that. Next up, it's an eight-man tag team match. The team of Alistair to Black, Ricochet and the Usos taking on Shinsuke Nakamura, Rusev and The Bar. Ricochet and Cesaro start things off. There is a singles match that I would like to see in the future. And then Cesaro takes him out with an uppercut, tags in Sheamus. Lots of tagging in and out. I'm not going to try and run down the whole match because we would be here all day. The heels take control after Rusev pulls the rope down, sending Jay flying to the outside and then tosses him into the ring steps. Shinsuke beats down Jay for a bit before Jay manages to tag in Jimmy. There's a great near fall and then absolute pandemonium as all of the wrestlers seem to have their signature moves charged. Uh, but ultimately, the babyface team wins following dual super kicks from the Usos. Then out comes WrestleMania host Alexa Bliss, who announces that all four teams in the ring right now will challenge for the SmackDown tag titles on the grandest stage of them all. WrestleMania. Everything breaks down again. There's a bit more brawling between all the teams. Alistair Black hits Black Mass. Ricochet does some, some flippy doos, and those two stand tall to close the segment. So up until the end of Raw, I guess, it really looked like we were going to be getting Alistair Black and Ricochet taking on the revival for the Raw tag belt at WrestleMania. That is, is not going to happen. And that's a match that I would have certainly liked to have seen. We'll probably get back to that in the future. I think that's quite likely. However, I'm really, really happy that all of these teams Eight guys who absolutely deserve to be on the WrestleMania card are going to get a match at WrestleMania. Sure, it seems a little bit thrown together, but they deserve the spot, especially the Usos, who have proven themselves to be one of the best tag teams ever. The match was going to get a B, but I'm going to up it to a B plus because I'm just so bloody happy that the Usos are going to get a match at WrestleMania and they're not just going to get chucked in some battle royal. Ugh. So... I'm a nice teacher, I know. Next up, out come the Iconics, who are, of course, in the Fatal 4-Way Women's Tag Team title match at WrestleMania. They're here to cut a promo. Peyton and Billy point out that they could pin any of the women in the match to pick up the gold, that they've already beaten Sasha and Bayley on SmackDown, and at WrestleMania, they're going to win the match 
become the women's tag team champions and make WrestleMania iconic! Just like that. And that's it. Lasted about two minutes, but I'm not complaining at all. Promos don't always need to run 15, 20 minutes. This did its job. It hyped the match. It got a bit of heat for the Iconics. Job done. I'd normally give this a C if it was anybody else, but I really, really like the Iconics and I'm in a very good mood because it's WrestleMania week. I'm going to be awake for the next 120 hours. I bloody love wrestling. So the grade is a C+. Plus. Nice teacher, nice man, nice haircut, nice cock. Out next is The Miz, who of course will take on the best in the world, Shane O'Mac, at a Falls Count Anywhere match on Sunday night. But his opponents tonight are all of sanity in a handicap match. Don't like where this is going. Miz cuts a quick promo, hyping the match before calling Shane McMahon a son of a bitch. Oh, isn't it mental in the PG era? Now, the easiest way to get a reaction from a crowd is saying the word bitch. Wonder if it works on YouTube. Bitch, bitch, bitch. Social media, hashtag bitch. We're getting demonetized. Before the match, out comes Shane McMahon, who instructs Greg Hamilton to introduce him properly as the best in the world. And then watches on as Miz absolutely demolishes all three members of Sanity. So this is like a Braun Strowman match as Miz pummels Alexander Wolf, Eric Young, Killian Dane before Shane loses his temper and makes this match a Falls Count Anywhere match and then puts up a picture of Shane manhandling Potato George on the Tron. Nice touch, like that. Sanity then take control, but not for long, as Miz puts Alexander Wolf through a table, Killian Dane into an electrical box, and then rams one of those big wheelie boxes straight into the face of Eric Young and picks up the win. Right, I'm going to give this a B minus, and a lot of people are going to be pissed off with that grade because they think it should be a lot lower because Sanity just got buried. But let me explain why. The match was good, a nice taster of what might be to come on Sunday, a creative finish, and one that makes The Miz look like a total badass. I also like the idea that because this is so personal, The Miz is able to channel this inner fury because he hates Shane McMahon so much he will go to any length to beat him. However, as I mentioned, the obvious issue here is the burial of sanity. And I don't like using that word because I think it's so overused. Anytime a wrestler loses a match in convincing fashion, fans are quick to jump on it and say, hey, that wrestler's been buried. And I think it's just a misused word. But in this case, it's completely appropriate. Sanity last night were buried, and I'm not sure it's something that they can easily come back from. Sanity were one of NXT's most dominant stables, and since their main roster call-up, they have been tragically misused from start to finish. Obviously, they lost Nikki Cross, which is a befuddling decision. I don't understand it. She made them stand out. She was a vital component in the makeup of Sanity, and now they're hardly ever on TV, and when they are on TV, they are, they're wrecked, they're ruined. And it's such a shame because they're tremendous wrestlers, tremendous characters, and I, I just don't see how they can come back from this. Anyway, then Becky Lynch arrives in a police car with the sirens going, because that's definitely what happens when you're released following arrest. Yep. Back to ringside and Corey Graves introduces the man, Becky Lynch, to the ring. She basically says, Piss off, Corey. She stands on the announce table and addresses the Baltimore cheap pop crowd. Becky talks about how at this point last year, Charlotte and Becky were the best of friends. Ronda Rousey was about to debut, and it looked like at this year's WrestleMania, we were going to get the baddest woman on the planet versus the Queen. That was until she slapped the smugness off of Charlotte's face at SummerSlam. Huge pop. This Sunday, MetLife Stadium, 80 plus thousand people in attendance. The first time the women are main eventing a WrestleMania. Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Ronda Rousey, winner takes all. So next time you see her, she will be the champ that she always knew she was. Double champ! <laughs> it was a weird ending to the promo. This was fine. Nothing was really added. Nothing was really taken away. I guess I'll give it a, a B minus. It was fine. Moving on. Next up, it's an 18 person mixed tag team match. I'm not gonna list all of the participants, but there's a lot of talent in there. You've got Andrade, you've got Heavy Machinery, you've got Sonya, you've got Mandy, you've got Asuka. 
let's talk about the match. Nikki Cross and Zelina Vega start things off in the ring, but they are quickly interrupted by you know who, Lacey Evans, who comes out, she does her things, and just go away. She's winning the Battle Royal on Sunday. Should be Asuka. No, it shouldn't. Asuka should be defending the women's title. It's gonna be Lacey Evans, isn't it? Lots of tagging in and out, as you would expect, with 18 pissing people. We get a caterpillar, we get a dance break, and then it all breaks down and people start throwing each other over the top rope because otherwise, how would we know how a battle royal works? We've never seen one before. This gets a C, a no contest, as Asuka stands tall after last eliminating Jeff Hardy. What am I talking about? Last eliminate, it wasn't a match. Asuka stands tall. Next up is the US champion Samoa Joe taking on Mustafa Ali. Sorry, Ali. Ali takes the fight to Joe in the early stages. There's a great dive to the outside, a beautiful tornado DDT from the middle rope. He then goes for the 450, but Joe dodges, locks in the Kikina clutch, and Ali passes out. Joe wins. This one gets a B minus. No real complaints here. It's a bit frustrating to see Ali in this position, but it's certainly something that he can recover from. And Samoa Joe, more importantly, is being booked as the absolute beast that he should have been booked as all along. Lovely stuff. Main event time, and it's a promo, but not just any promo. It's a contract signing for the WWE title match at WrestleMania. Love a contract signing. Brian out first, followed by Kofi to a mammoth pop. Michael Cole starts talking, but Brian goes, no, 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 Michael, I'll take it from here. Brian immediately signs the contract and says, Kofi, I know you're going to sign this contract. I know I'm going to face you for the WWE title at WrestleMania, but I'm here to educate the masses. But he can't get a pissing word in edgeways because the crowd are so, so hot for Kofi Kingston. And I love this because there's huge, genuine support for Kofi Kingston and huge, genuine heat for Daniel Bryan. Wrestling 101. The camera pans over the crowd and literally everyone from every demographic, children to adult, cheering Kofi Kingston, booing Daniel Bryan relentlessly. And I have no problem, obviously, with the women main eventing WrestleMania this year. That's fantastic. But if the main event was based on crowd investment, here's your main event. Brian's lesson is that the WWE universe shouldn't be complacent, that good isn't good enough for 11 years. A little bit of success isn't enough success for 11 years. Do not be complacent. WWE universe, do not be a bystander like Kofi has been a bystander for his entire life. He's been in Kofi Kingston's position with all of this crowd support, but they are feeding off of you, not the other way around. They are parasites. Kofi, do not mistake a fad for reality. Then Kofi grows tired of Daniel Bryan's BS and says, hey, we've been listening to you for months on end. Now it's time to listen to me. Kofi says that Bryan doesn't know a damn thing about him. He watched, he observed as Daniel Bryan won his first WWE title. But here's the thing. You don't know what Kofi's been through, and it all leads to this. The one common thread is that Brian knows what this feels like, and Brian, you know what comes next. At WrestleMania, I beat you, and I become the WWE Champion. Contract signed, stare down, end of episode. Fantastic. This segment gets an A+. It's the third time that I've ever given that grade, but it's a segment which is so, so deserving of it. It is one of Daniel Bryan's best WWE promos and definitely Kofi's best promo ever. I was hanging on every word that Kofi said. His delivery was so sincere. It was just terrific. WWE have done an amazing job here, utilizing backstage sentiment and real life to create this unbelievably compelling wrestling storyline. And Honestly, I haven't been so hyped for a match at WrestleMania since Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 30. Overall, this SmackDown gets a B plus, dragged up a little bit by the closing segment, which as I may have just made clear, was very, very good. Meanwhile, over on Raw, we've got Apollo Crews versus Jinder in a lumberjack match. SmackDown has been consistently fantastic for the last almost a year now. 
and the storytelling's great, the booking is largely good, and it's a pleasure to watch. Rather than finishing with a joke, I actually have an apology to make. At the end of last week's episode of Graded, I made a malicious and distasteful joke at the expense of Shawn Michaels, and I would like to apologize for doing so. It's since transpired that Shawn Michaels has blocked me on Twitter, and I completely understand why he would do that. Honestly, I never expected Shawn Michaels to see that joke, um, but I guess he has one eye on the channel. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.